Hi, I'm Brian Holt, a Principal Program Manager at Microsoft, and welcome to the complete intro to databases. I created this course because databases are a fundamental building block for modern applications. I want you to be able to choose the best database for the problem that you're trying to solve. In this course, we'll cover things like document-based databases like MongoDB, relational databases like Postgres, graph databases like Neo4j, key value stores like Redis, and how and when you'd want to use each one of those. I hope you enjoy the course. What NoSQL means is that it's a database that doesn't use SQL. And that's, that's it. That's the whole thing of the term. It was a really hot marketing term in like 2010, something like that, and just stuck, right? Um, it's a really meaningless term, but I'm putting it in so that you see it because you're going to be seeing it in documentation all over and in marketing material. Um, it just means it's a non-relational database. So you're going to see that we're going to talk about SQL databases here in a second. No SQL is anything that falls outside of that, which is a lot of things. What we're really going to be talking about today is a document-based database, which fulfills the, the no SQL uh, paradigm. Um, this even gets a little bit fuzzier when you realize that some no SQL databases can handle SQL queries. So it's, it's wildly confusing and dumb. So yeah, these databases end up being quite dissimilar from each other, but still get lumped together. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of reasons that you would choose one of these. One of the biggest uh, advantages to a NoSQL database is that um, they're schemaless, right? So you can actually be defining a data, like a data schema on the fly. And it makes it really easy to get up and running with one of these. And it's also very conducive to the dynamic scripting kind of thinking that you would get from a JavaScript or a Python type language. The, the mental models work well together, and, and that's why we're going to start with, with this one. If we come back over here and say db.pets.count, you can see now we have 10,001 records in our database. We have 10,001 documents in our collection. It's the correct terminology. It's going to take me a bit. As you can see, though, for the most part, people use all this terminology interchangeably because it, they're all roughly the same idea. So now I wonder if I do db.pets.find1 you can see here. So I think it goes by created date. So I think it'll find the first item that matches it, and it'll find the first one that was created. I think it's the ordering on find one. But I'm not sure. It's ambiguous, and you never want to rely on ambiguous behavior in a, in a that, that sounds like something that would crash your app like two months into it, and you wouldn't know why. So the first one here is find one. We still We saw this one already, find one, and we found Luna. But let's do some other kind of interesting queries here. So let's say we wanted to find one of index, you know, 1337. This object here is kind of, it's your query object, right? This, you can use this to kind of filter in various different in interesting ways. Uh, so this returned a cat that's a Havanese named Beethoven. It's interesting. Um, you can put multiple things in here. So let's say we wanted to find a uh, a da a type dog and that was of age nine right so it's going to match all of those right so this is age nine and it's a dog and you can see it's index eight so that one returned that was one of the first ones that was inserted into the database you might ask why did we have this index thing well, we don't actually technically need this in fact I would even tell you not to do it but we're going to be doing some indexing later, and I wanted to have a, something unique to index on. So that's why that index is there. And then let's do find. So let's say we wanted to find all dogs of age 9. So I'm just going to release that. So it's db.pets.find type dog age 9. And you can see here we got quite a few. In fact, I think this is 20. So we got 20 different dogs here of, of age 9. And it doesn't actually return all of those to you at once. So if I want to have multiple of these return, or I want to get more of them, you can see here it says type it for more. It stands for iterate. So if I type it, it's going to give me more and more and more and more and more. So it's going to start iterating all over these results. It only gives you 20 of them at a time because it assumes most people don't want you know a thousand records all at once. Just like no SQL is kind of a dumb marketing term, so is SQL databases. 
When I say SQL databases, what I really mean is relational databases. And you also see that sometimes abbreviated as RD BMS, which I think is Relational Database Management System, I think is what that stands for. Um, but again, that means uh, an SQL-based database or a relational database. It's also important to remember that not all relational databases use SQL, and not all non-relational databases don't use uh, uh, SQL. But again, I'm trying to use the most common terminology here to hopefully like demystify some of this stuff. So when you see SQL database, you can kind of loosely associate or even strongly associate that with a uh, relational database in your head. Hopefully that's as clear as mud because marketing is dumb. I don't know why these people still try and confuse us more, but let's talk about relational databases. For the rest of the time, I'm gonna try and use relational database because that's actually probably the closest thing to what I mean. So what is a relational database? The best thing to think about with relational databases is Excel. Right, Excel or numbers or some sort of spreadsheet. That is like the easiest picture. It's like a table of data. And notice that the, the name of a collection in a relational database is called a table. That, that is no coincidence. Um, yeah. So it's good to think of this as uh, rows and columns. In fact, that's those are terms that I'll use um, as rows and columns. Um, but one of the things with the relational database is it has a defined and very structured schema. Whereas with, if you remember in Mongo, we were writing to our collection and we just added the owner field on the fly. That's very easy to do in MongoDB. And it's not very easy to do in SQL because SQL is like, you need to tell me about all of these fields before you can give them to me. If you try and write something that doesn't exist, it just won't let you. So what we would have to do, you actually have to issue an entire statement called an alter table statement, which you don't want to do. Alter tables are very expensive. As in, like we used to do alter tables at, uh, when I worked at Reddit, it would literally take down like Reddit for us to do that. So we were very cautious to not uh, alter our tables very much. So a big thing up, up front is defining your schema. But here's the secret power of relational databases is that they're very good at describing relations, right? Whereas with MongoDB, you don't wanna ever have like this collection refer to this collection over here. That's, that's not a good idea. With SQL, that's like a core component of how SQL actually works is that you want to have data that relates to each other. So you're going to have multiple different tables and those tables are going to refer to each other. Let's create our first table. So like I said, we're going to be doing a message board today with Postgres. I kind of tried to choose like a good problem for each one of these. So they're not exactly going to be the same problem. Whereas like a pet adoption app where is good for Mongo something that's more relational, like a, a message board is really good for uh, a relational database. So we're gonna say create table. Now, something I'm gonna tell you up front, it's optional to capitalize all this stuff. So you can totally say create table like this, it'll get it for your benefit. And in general, um, people tend to capitalize the command so they can see the difference very quickly between what they're inputting and what is like a official SQL kind of thing. If you're feeling lazy, like I often do when I'm writing SQL, um, feel free to just put everything in lowercase. Just know that that's why I'm capitalizing. It's hopefully for your benefit. So create table users, open parenthesis. We're gonna create a table here. And we're gonna have a user ID. This is gonna be, you can put this as int or integer. I'm gonna put integer just for this one. We're gonna make this a primary key. So a primary key means it's like this is the thing that the database is primarily going to index this on. So MongoDB had that underscore ID. This is that, but for this. Um, and then we're gonna have always our generated, generated always as identity. This is going to be an auto incrementing ID. So the first record that we're going to insert into this database, or table rather, is gonna have ID one, the next will have ID two, then ID three, then ID four, and it will keep track of that for us. We don't have to keep track of it. That's what this generated always as identity means. That's what it's for. In previous versions of Postgres, this was called a serial. Um, if you're familiar with Postgres, you might have seen that before. It's not exactly the same thing, 
but it's really close. Uh, the reason why they switched to generated always as identity, this is actually part of the official SQL uh, spec. So there is a, an SQL spec that all of these like SQL Server and Postgres and MySQL share. And for the most part, they're relatively compatible. But Serial was a Postgres thing, and so they wanted to come back to the, the official SQL way of doing it. And so that's why they came into generated always as identity. So for example, I think this create table statement that we're about to issue, I think it would work as is with MySQL, for example. Not all of them will, but some of them will. User ID, OK. Then we're going to have a username. We have to tell what kind of thing it is, whereas this was an integer, right, which is going to be a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? The username, we want it to be a string of characters, right? So in uh, SQL, you call that a varchar, or a variable amount of characters, or a string. So this varchar, we're going to give it a length. We're going to say usernames can only be 25 long. That's what this means. It's going to be unique. So no two people can have the same username. I think that makes sense. And we're going to say this is never null, which means if you're going to insert into this database, you must include a, a username, or I will not accept this query. OK, same thing with email. Varchar, we'll make this 50. I don't know if that's a good length for emails. It's probably too short, but that's what we're doing for now. Unique, not null. OK, full name, Varchar. 100, not null. I don't know if full name 100 is, that's probably not long enough either. Like the King of Thailand couldn't put his name in there. If you've never looked at the, the King of Thailand's name, look at it. So, a lot. <laughs> uh, last login. We'll make this a timestamp. So, what we're going to do here is we're going to, every time that the user logs in, we're going to log that they've logged in with this last login. And this is useful for if someone doesn't log in for like six months, you can just say, all right, clear out all of the people that haven't logged in in six months. This one can be null, right? So if someone creates an account and never logs in, this could be null, right? So we're not going to put not null. And then we're going to do a created on of when they created this account. This will be a timestamp that's not null. OK, and there you go. We now have created a table. If we put slash D, you can see here we have a users table. That's what this first one represents. And then the second one, it creates this little sequence type that it uses that to keep track of where we are in that auto incrementing ID. So let's go ahead and write another query now to query for the relationship. So uh, what I'm going to do here now after I've done this, we're going to start looking at Aubrey Plaza, because I think she's very funny. And we're going to match p person acted in directionally towards movie m movie. And actually, let's just grab that r. And we're going to return r. So in this particular case, we're getting all of the people that act in various different roles inside of Scott Pilgrim versus the world. So you can actually query directly for these edges or relationships. OK, let's put a where clause in here, where p.name equals Aubrey Plaza. And then you want to return p, right? Because we want to find the person uh, that acted in Scott Pilgrim versus the world. So that'll be Aubrey Plaza, right? Or we can look at the R. We can see that Aubrey Plaza in Scott P Pilgrim versus the world played Julie Powers, right? Or again, you, you can return m, which will be the movie, which will be Scott Pilgrim versus the world. So this is actually would give you every movie that Aubrey Plaza played. And in this case, we just have one movie in our database, but this would give you all of them. Mm -hmm.